All right. I will admit those as they arrive. Um, I did forget that tonight is Passover, so that might affect a few people. And tomorrow starts the you know the Easter triduum, so that might throw some people off too. Um, welcome, Bob. From Thank you. Sure, correct. Um, and uh, I put his website uh, in the chat if anybody wants to look at it. He's done a lot of uh, Saber bios. Um, I'm looking forward to this presentation. Um, obviously, being a Ruth aficionado, um, <clears throat> I think we all know by now that the Orioles home opener tomorrow has been postponed until Friday um, due to potential inclement weather. Um, and I believe the Minnesota Twins is the same thing, but they're on the ground. So it's a little bit of a different story. Out there. Yeah. And, the, fan who is, and the Phillies and Mets, too. Oh, they postponed? Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, they don't play each other, but their Phillies game and the Mets game are both postponed. Must, must be the whole East Coast then. All right. Yeah. But the Red Sox squeezed in enough time to get swept by the Pirates. So. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I made Bob a, a co-host. I'll let, let him do a little bio about himself and then we'll go right into the presentation. As always, um, save questions to the end unless you want to put them in the chat. So, all right, Bob, take it away. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I've been with Saver about 10 years and I did start in the bio project very early on. And I probably started working on this book somewhere around 2014, 2015. Took way too long, but doesn't every project, I guess. Um, always interested in the end of Babe Ruth's career, why he went back to Boston. And since I'm dealing with um, Baltimore folk here, I tweaked my presentation a little bit because there's some really interesting connections. And I'm not talking about, of course, he grew up there. Uh, I'm talking about the end of his life and some things that really, really get overlooked. Um, in the uh, biographies that just focus on the Yankee career and all the home runs, I, I say in the beginning of the book, I wanted to uh, understand a Ruth that I could relate to, middle age, <clears throat> flabby, um, you know, desperate for a job, you know, wondering where time has gone and things like that. So it was uh, kind of an, <clears throat> an interesting endeavor doing this. And it's been out about a month now through McFarland and all that. So what I'll do, I'll just go ahead and get the PowerPoint up here. Okay. Everybody got me there? Okay. So this is the, th this is an interesting cover. Um, when I found this picture, this isn't a picture of Ruth you can easily find in your Google searches and things like that. Um, I mean, there's not a whole lot of Boston Braves photos, but there's some ones that are more famous than this. But I chose this because this picture really symbolizes th this era of his life. Everything was somber. You know, he's bundled up. This was in Wrigley Field right about um, May of 35. And it just kind of summarizes the whole era with the Braves of everything somber and glum, and he's just trying to hang on. And so I, I thought this was a, a good uh, picture for the, the cover of the book. Uh, but what we're talking about here is why Ruth came back to Boston and um, why the Boston Braves. And so I call it a failing hero and a forfeited franchise. A lot of people don't realize this Braves team of 1935 was so bad, it actually was taken over by the National League. It was a, a quote unquote forfeited franchise because it was completely belly up. And so a lot of things happened in this year, uh, which started with such great expectations. I love the quote by Grantland Rice, and it kind of summarizes a lot of what I do in this book where he wrote that so few can appreciate the shock that suddenly comes when all dreams and all illusions suddenly blow up, when one suddenly feels tired and old and out of date, bewildered and a trifle dazed, wondering what it is all about. I think that summarizes Ruth, trifle dazed, wondering what it's all about, very bewildering time of his life to go from the most popular person on the planet to someone who couldn't even get a job anymore. Um, so I start with 
um, August 12 of 1934, he's still with the Yankees. He has announced just a couple of days before that he is most likely going to be retiring. And retiring for him meant maybe a team was going to offer me a managerial position or I'll be a, a player manager. I'll put myself in the lineup on weekends, you know, something like that. But this was the largest crowd that Fenway Park ever had at the time. And you can see the, the roped off sections of people sitting on the grass because of the overflow crowd, because everyone thought this is the last chance to see Babe Ruth in Boston. And so it was, a, as Paul Shannon in the Boston Post wrote, a farewell tribute to baseball's idol. So it was quite, a, uh, quite an event there. And this was where he said in the interview just a few days before that he was definitely going to retire. He says, I don't know what the future holds for me. I would like to remain in the game as a manager and perhaps do a little hitting on Saturdays and Sundays and so forth like that. But he really has no plan at all as the season ends and he goes with those all-star teams to the all-star players to Japan under the tutelage of Connie Mack and more or less, Mac gave him the managerial reins, whatever it was, with a team like this. I mean, I, what did you really do um, with with Gehrig and so forth? And that's uh, Claire, of course, on his left, and daughter Julia on his uh, stepdaughter Julia on his right. So Ruth, Ruth is pretty much taking it easy here, uh, going to Japan. And after the Japan tour is done, he continues on a world cruise with the family. And so he is asked numerous times, well, where are you going to play when you get back? And he doesn't really put a lot of emphasis on it. Back home, however, there were a lot of rumors about what Ruth was going to do, because we know that uh, most owners were reluctant to give him any type of um, managerial position. So <laughs> you, really, <laughs> you really have the interesting... Uh, you know, the $75,000 offer for him to join the circus and ride around in an elephant to take me out to the ball game. That was a real thing. Um, the bearded wonders, the house of David team, they, they wanted Ruth to come. They were going to give him $35,000 and said he didn't have to have any whiskers. Um, and, you know, he hears about man managership when he's over there in Manila and he's golfing and, you know, he just, he just kind of puts things aside. But back home, there was these questions about where Ruth would go. And it was interesting reading the minutes of the American League ownership meetings in December because everyone was worried, how do we get rid of Babe Ruth? Uh, Jacob Rupert and Ed Barrow of the Yankees, how do you get rid of him? How do you get rid of somebody who's larger than life? And a lot of fears were around if he went to a National League team, look at the loss of gate receipts we would get. But no one was willing to say, hey, I'll take him on because they knew he was becoming such a liability in the field. His power wasn't what it once was. And of course, you've got someone who will speak up, speak back to authority and, and things like that. So no one was willing to really take on this risk, but they worried about what would happen by getting rid of him. So <clears throat> that, then comes Judge Fuchs and the Boston Braves. So here's a little background of the judge born in Germany in 1878 to Orthodox Jews who came to the U.S. He grows up on the Lower East Side, Manhattan, in the university settlement housing. He eventually attends law classes at NYU, and graduates around 1901, <clears throat> and begins a very successful career in New York City and becomes New York City magistrate 1917 and 18. Very brief time, but yet that's where he acquires the, the nickname, the judge. And one of the things that he's most famous for was defending Arnold Rothstein, uh, as you know, involved in the 1919 Black Sox scandal and a lot of things like that. But Fuchs defended him in a different unrelated case. And um, as uh, one of the biographers back in the 90s that was writing about Judge Fuchs, he, he, would, he would defend saint and sinner. It just didn't matter who it was. He was, he was involved in a lot of uh, cases, very popular. He was also very well known in the baseball circles because he was a friend of John McGraw. And he uh, was in the social occasions and knew McGraw, went to the polo grounds. 
And it was in a social occasion in which uh, he was with McGraw, and McGraw points out the Boston Braves owner, uh, George Washington Grant. And he says, boy, you know, George is going to be selling the Braves. You ought to buy the team. And the judge, of course, had the resources to do so, but was hesitant because what does he know about running a baseball team? And he says, well, I'll do it if you can convince Christy Mathewson to come out of retirement and join me in the ownership, uh, you know, the ownership committee and help run the team. And of course, Matthewson is still recovering from the gas of World War I. He's, he's up in upstate New York. He's out of the game. He's, you know, he has his uh, breathing difficulties. But they convince Maddie to come and uh, help the judge. And so the two of them, for until Maddie died in 1925, they tried everything to build up a crowd at Braves Field. Uh, bringing in exhibitions, bringing in uh, theaters and movies and dances and things like that, all kinds of entertainment. In the days in which we're so familiar with baseball owners using stadiums to bring in concerts, uh, Fuchs and Maddie were doing that back in the 1920s, but it still didn't capitalize on anything in terms of helping out the Braves, because this is what I call the boring 20s. You can see the Braves records throughout the decade. Um, finishing last or next to last, um, the the Phillies were uh, gracious enough to to uh, secede them for eighth place uh, n- numerous times, uh, but the Braves were always right there in the bottom. And so Judge Fuchs actually decides around 1929 um, that um, yeah, and you can compare this here with Braves attendance and Red Sox attendance. The, the boring 20s was the Red Sox as well. These were awful, awful teams in the city. Um, and so in some cases, the Braves actually outdrew the Red Sox at uh, Fenway. Um, so Judge Fuchs realizes in 1929 that we don't have much money. We don't have much chance to win. If we're going to lose, I can do it much more cheaply. And so he names himself manager in 1929, and it becomes a big farce and Um, just a big joke and everything like that. Um, And uh, so he realizes he really had no business doing that. But that's kind of the guy Judge Fuchs was, just willing to try just about anything. Uh, And it's during this time that he grows in debt. Now, he started as a millionaire attorney and puts his own money into the team, but eventually is starting to lose money. He depends on Charles F. Adams, Now, Charles F. Adams grew up in Vermont and became very famous for creating one of the first grocery store chains that became in the New England area, and I don't know how far northeast it went, uh, first national stores. Um, And growing up in Vermont, he caught the hockey bug right in the very beginning. He would travel as a kid across the border and he would go watch the Stanley Cup. And eventually when he starts making money, he brings professional hockey to the United States and he creates the Boston Bruins. He becomes a major contributor in the building of the Boston Garden because he said the the, the Boston Arena was not adequate. So he is a major funder of the Boston Garden. Later on, and that really comes into play with his relationship with Fuchs and this 1935 season, he puts down major investment in Suffolk Downs, a race track um, in um, out in Boston. So he, um, as one writer said, he everything he touched turned to gold. Of course, except <laughs> except the Boston Braves. Um, but he put two hundred thousand dollars of his own money in cash to Fuchs to buy out uh, another uh, stockholder to buy into the Braves, and from that point on, he was basically Fuchs's benefactor, generously giving over money, not wanting to take control of the team, but finding himself really holding the whole cards. <clears throat> over time, and this is where um, nineteen thirty. Um, Judge Fuchs hires Bill McKechnie to come in and become manager, and McKechnie actually does a pretty decent job with the Braves in the early part of the 1930s, even gets them over 
uh, 500 or better three times in a row. 1932, they were 1930. Uh, let's see, 30, 33, I believe it was. They were they were right in the pennant race right up until Labor Day. And so you can see that uh, Bill McKechnie somehow figured out to take this group of castoffs that they often were and uh, get them at least into the first division. Um, however, that doesn't translate to anything as far as money goes. Fuchs lost $265,000 or thereabouts between 1923, 1933. He had actually borrowed money from the Giants and the Cardinals to stay afloat. And because that was a conflict of interest, the National League kept Fuchs stock as collateral. So the National League was holding that on. And because Fuchs was behind in payments, uh, there was a big crisis. What was going to happen? The National is the National League going to take over the Braves in 19? It was 19. 31, I believe, uh, 32, actually 32, yes. Um, <clears throat> once again, Charles Adams comes to his aid and he buys out all of that stock. And so now Adams has about a half million dollars in 1930s money invested in this team. And he himself says he's not really a baseball person between, between the Bruins and, uh, you know, he's, he's getting into the racing craze and his grocery store. He just didn't have time to run this thing. So he is putting pressure on Judge Fuchs to pay me back, get me out of this. And the only way Fuchs was able to do this was to convince his friends to help buy back some of his stock. And that way he would just own stock to his friends instead of Adams. And so people did that. And he kind of got out of some of that debt um, because it, for one thing, Fuchs was very loved in Boston, had a lot of connections politically and socially, and he was able to um, at, at least survive as far as that goes in, in 33. This is, this is an interesting thing, though, of what was happening in Boston. You can see the Braves. Look at that attendance in 32 and 33 compared to the Red Sox attendance. And then look at the complete switch in 34. The big change, of course, being Tom Yockey bought the Red Sox in 1933. And while people like Connie Mack were selling off their stars because they were in financial, you know, difficult financial straits, Yockey, who basically inherited all of his money, uh, had plenty of it and was willing to, you know, um, rebuild part of Fenway Park and make some adjustments and go get Jimmy Fox and Lefty Grove and players like that to make the Red Sox more attractive. So Fuchs is dealing with this huge onrush of, you know, people going to Fenway instead of Braves Field. And the second thing that is going on is America's racing craze. And this picture on the left is an example of what was happening uh, just across the border right here where I live in New Hampshire at, uh, at uh, the uh, racing track here in New Hampshire. And so folks were coming up here to go to the races or they were going down to Rhode Island to the, the racetracks and Massachusetts had not yet uh, made that possible. So between the two things, uh, going to the races or um, going to the Red Sox, there wasn't very much left for people to go to Braves Field, and so it suffered. So Fuchs was really um, very shorthanded here. So because Fuchs is willing to try just about anything and Charles Adams has money, he says, let's capitalize on the racing craze and let's put a, a Greyhound racing track at Braves Field. And so they had it all drawn up. They were going to make a track around the field. They were going to bring in portable lighting and they would have racing at night and baseball during the day. Sounded like a good sound financial investment. And it seemed to have a, a lot of uh, support in the Boston area. But think about the National League with Judge Landis and having betting at a ballpark and things like that. So automatically, um, Fuchs is, uh, you know, doesn't have a chance with this because uh, National League owners are very worried about this. And uh, incoming President Ford Frick, he, 
issues a statement, he's against it. And of course, we know Judge Landis. Uh, Judge Landis actually came out and said that he would quit the game if, if they made this happen um, because of, you know, 1919 and the stigma of, of that. <clears throat> so that can't happen. So now there has to be a, a, a change in how is Fuchs going to survive with this team that is in the red. So there starts to be rumors in December that uh, Charles Adams at the uh, baseball owners meetings is talking to Jacob Rupert and he's looking for Ruth and different rumors that were going on about this <clears throat> because as I mentioned the Yankees are trying to get rid of Babe Ruth they just can't figure out how do you how do you do it how do you fire Babe Ruth and so they knew that the Braves were looking for just about anything um, to happen so um, and here's a couple of things about Ruth managing, you know, because the stigma was always around how can you manage the Yankees when you can't even manage yourself and all that. The the stigma of Ruth going back into the 20s, the wildness and, you know, he by 1935, he's 40 years old. He's pretty much calmed down. His his wife, Claire, pretty much has a, a strict, you know, uh, a strict diet for him, a strict regimen, you know, you're home at night, you're not out partying and things like that. And Ruth had really settled down, but I think the stigma of who he was um, uh, kept a lot of owners from wanting to jump into that. So uh, here we go in January of 1935, a very interesting month because the Braves actually become a homeless ball club. The Braves did not own Braves Field. Uh, they still owned, they still paid rent to the Gaffney estate. James Gaffney was the owner in 1912, 12, 13, 14, and he had built Braves Field. And so the uh, Commonwealth Realty was, was the, in charge of the estate. And so the Braves were behind in rent, of course. So the the real estate company talks with the Boston Kennel Club and comes up with a deal of bringing in Greyhound Racing, and they would be a much more stable tenant than the Braves. And so automatically, when people are opening up the newspapers on a cold Saturday morning in January, they realize the Braves don't even have a place to play. Tom Yockey wasn't willing to use Fenway Park for that, and um, so... This was another crisis that the National League had to step in. So they, they did, and they took over the lease uh, by paying off the uh, estate. And so they took over that lease and actually had to even provide money for this poor Braves team to even get to spring training because there wasn't even enough money to even do that. So they come up with a plan, uh, Fuchs and Adams and um, some of the political people in Boston that in order to save this franchise, they needed to have an advanced ticket sale drive. And so they did such, uh, getting people to buy tickets in blocks, and that way it would give them enough money ahead of time to get the season started. It's really kind of humorous to think about all of this. And at the meantime, they're looking for a new buyer for this team because they realize that Fuchs just can't do this. And because of the racing connections that Adams has, um, nobody, is, nobody from Landis or Frick is willing to say, let's just let Charles Adams run it. And for one thing, he didn't even want to run the team. So here you go. Here's why Ruth comes in, because this is the next big plan. Uh, Ruth needs a job. We need something to bring in a, a crowd. And so here we go. And so the deal is made with uh, between Rupert and Fuchs, where Ruth is placed on waivers. And basically, they give him away for free because in the public eye, this was giving Ruth this great opportunity to manage and things like that. Because Fuchs gave a lot of promises that he would be an executive, he would be an assistant manager, he would have a share in the profits and the stock, he could become a part owner. And in the contract, it says, if, 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 if it was in the mutual interest of the club, perhaps you would be managing in 1936, and they would bump McKechnie up to the front office and things like that. 
But in Ruth's mind, of course, this was a done deal. This was going to happen. And so he goes into this whole thing thinking, I'm going to be the manager in 1936. Uh, well, such was not really the case. It really wasn't going to be like that at all. But they have a big banquet anyway. And of course, Boston is all aglow with Babe Ruth coming back and, and all the celebrations that were going on. Anybody who was anybody was at that banquet that night, the end of February. And off we go to spring training and Ruth is drawing all kinds of crowds early on, um, crowds that nobody had ever seen for spring training games. And uh, I love this picture with all these hats. You know, it's really, it's really a fascinating picture here. Um, but he draws all these crowds in spring training. So Fuchs is thinking this is a good sign because money is flowing in. Um, and uh, so maybe this is going to work. We come back to Boston just before the beginning of the season. And here's uh, Ruth working out with the Braves at the Harvard cage. And um, here he is signing autographs for kids at Holy Cross. He was drawing big crowds in all these exhibition places, all these exhibition games that were, were being held. And so the season starts and opening day is actually also called Judge Fuchs Day. Um, Mayor Curley, uh, Governor Curley was there to present this plaque to Fuchs because Fuchs, because of his advanced ticket sale drive, had brought in enough money to salvage the team. And so they honored Fuchs that day. And it just so happened to be that that was the day Ruth hits a home run and opening day against Carl Hubble and people start thinking about the Braves winning the pennant because this is the most exciting thing anyone could think of of happening at Braves Field. Um, so everything starts really well, but it ends very quickly. He becomes the butt of jokes because his fielding is so atrocious. Um, Bill Cunningham even writes that the crowd all looked, looked the other way as he waddled gloomily back to the dimness of the dugout. It was the kind of thing the church congregation does when the Easter soloist's voice breaks on high C. They all felt sorry for him without being able to do much about it. So Ruth is, you know, the reality is he really can't play anymore. He's, he's a liability in the field. So we drag through April and May. Um, cutting him again, saying, the babe, God love him, can't see himself as he is. He sees himself as he was. By that, I mean he can't realize that he's rich, elder, elderly, fat, and failing. Of course, there is that last hurrah in Pittsburgh. He hits the three home runs, the final three, the, the last one going right over the roof of Forbes Field and is the stuff of legend. He could have retired right at that point. It probably would have been smart to. He plays another week or so and then injures himself again. And so he's dragging along. And then comes the day on June 2nd where basically Ruth tells the Braves that he is going to voluntarily retire. Meantime, McKeshney has talked to Fuchs and said, my pitcher's are going to revolt if we have Ruth in the outfield because it is destroying their pitching. Um, so basically Ruth is, however you want to interpret it, he quits or he is fired one way or the other. They were both happening at the same time. Um, but the uh, picture there on the left, I couldn't resist using it even though the picture is not that great. Uh, Ruth is leaving the hotel in Boston the last time to go back to New York and he walks right into the middle of a wedding and is getting doused with confetti and makes a comment of no one who's been fired has ever gotten quite a reception like this. Um, and he um, goes back to New York and he has his crowd following him there as he's back at his apartment. Uh, now to, to summarize where the Braves go from there, August 1st, Judge Fuchs steps down. He's completely broke, and Charles Adams basically takes over. And Adams has to send out an SOS to all brave stockholders asking for extra money because they didn't even think they had enough money to finish the season. Um, that season, they finished 38 
and 115. And you can see how they rank all time as one of the very worst teams um, of all time. When I did this presentation previously, there was a discussion about they're even worse than the 62 Mets, which was um, quite a feat. So 38 and 115. Who wants to buy the Braves is the question. And a number of people start coming through. Um, I don't know if anybody recognizes the person on the right next to Charles Adams there. Nobody in Boston got it. <laughs> but it's George Preston Marshall, who was the owner of the Boston Redskins at the time. And um, yeah. He was looking at, yeah, uh, he was looking at buying the Braves as well. And he was very, very close to doing that. If it was not for um, the bank, he probably would have because Adams would have given him the keys and said, good luck. There you go. Um, and uh, so what I raise in the book briefly is if we had George Preston Marshall who became the last owner to integrate in the NFL and Tom Yockey, who was the last to integrate major league baseball in the same city during the same era, what might have happened? You know, it's, it's kind of interesting to think, um, but, uh, but Marshall had quite a plan of what he was going to do for Braves field. He had all kinds of interesting things, but the, uh, the bank just wasn't up for what he had to offer there. And so Adams was still stuck trying to, get this team sold and eventually he can't do it the national league takes it over and so the the braves are considered a forfeited franchise by december they have made agreement with bob quinn who was the former red sox owner and at the time was um the president in brooklyn <clears throat> he uh comes through with adams adams has a lot of confidence in quinn and they work out a deal that Adam, uh, that Quinn puts some money down, gets the team, and will pay back Adams within 10 years. So that stabilizes the Braves, and which now is no longer the nickname because they changed the nickname. Uh, this was an interesting thing in that uh, Quinn never liked the term Braves, so he named them the Bees. They did a, they did a, um, uh, the fans could submit their uh, drawing for that. They submitted names that they wanted and they chose bees and, um, and so forth. And, and Quinn, I don't know, I've never found this anywhere else, but Quinn said in the newspaper, he said, if I had stayed in Brooklyn, I would have changed the name Dodgers too, because I never liked that, you know? So, <laughs> so that might've changed the history significantly there. Um, so anyway, um, Quinn does not even need 10 years to pay back Adams. He eventually builds up a syndicate and eventually is bought out by Lou Perini and others. Um, and the Braves go on, of course, for another few years going to the World Series in 48. And then, of course, you know, the rest of the story moving to Milwaukee and then Atlanta. Um, but Judge Fuchs stayed around Boston, was still very loved, uh, lived up until 1961. One of his last appearances was uh, Ted Williams' final home run. He made his way down to the uh, clubhouse. And so his legacy in Boston is actually quite significant because he was so well loved among sports writers and fans that they have an annual award called the Judge Emil Fuchs Memorial Award, uh, recognized for longevity in the game. Now, where I go at the end of the book was a place I did not expect to be when I started this thing. I thought I would just summarize Ruth at the end of his life and, and so forth, but I realized there was more there that really hadn't been covered before. And really, when you look at the, the hopes and dreams of what he wanted to do with managing, was never given the chance. Um, Claire Ruth describes the era as He's always waiting for the phone to ring, hoping there was some job for him. And of course, we know the, the 1938 Brooklyn coaching job didn't last very long, wasn't really significant. And he spent a lot of time just sitting in the kitchen, bawling his eyes out because he just felt rejected by the game that he had made into a big business. 
So I kind of examined that a little bit of Ruth, the person. But yet I think he found fulfillment at the end of his life. And 1946 on, of course, he is now diagnosed with cancer. But he is also signed to this job uh, for Ford Border Company, which is um, promoting the American Legion Youth Baseball Tournament. And so Ruth is going to go around the country speaking to kids and pretty much going back right where he started, right back into the, the youth of the game. And so we see a lot of great pictures of him touring the country over the last couple of years of his life. Um, and crowds would follow him everywhere and just some real, real cool pictures of, of him meeting kids and talking with kids and um and so forth like that i think he really did find fulfillment and he even said so himself that he wanted he wanted to be a manager but then he realized he wanted to live for the kids and that was more important to him <clears throat> saint francis of assisi didn't love birds as much as the babe loved kids lee montville wrote so there's a number of these great little little um situations of him meeting with kids and talking with kids and things like that. Now, um, we're all familiar with the Pulitzer Prize winning photo of Ruth in his last appearance at Yankee Stadium, you know, the big number three and the, the crowd cheering and things like that. One of the most forgotten things of the end of Ruth's life is he went back to Baltimore in July of of, of um, July of 48, just a month, a month before he died, he went back. There was a charity game that he was going to be going back for. The game didn't happen. It was raining. So imagine this. They put Babe Ruth in a car and they drive around the city for a couple of hours. And the newspapers talked about people who would stand at the corners and wave. And even a lady who picked up her baby and held the baby up as if, as if this were a king or the Pope or something like that. I think that's uh, quite an amazing image um, for the end of his life. The one that's really forgotten. Um, so he, he gets there in Baltimore and his sister is there. And, uh, and then the, he, the two fathers here from the uh, two brothers from St. Mary's uh, are there. So he kind of like comes, comes home. He circles back home. Uh, I love this quote by Grantland Rice. And this really moved me in a lot of directions here because Rice wrote that Ruth faced suffering beyond all comprehension, but his story was much greater nearing the trail's end of glory than he ever was hitting 714 home runs and giving the nation the greatest thrills that sport has ever known. No one can keep him from a sick kid or a broken or blind human being. He seems to feel they belong to him and he belongs to them. He will travel the few remaining miles for the betterment of the cripples, the heart weary, and the underprivileged those who might need help and inspiration as he once needed help so badly. I, I'd never found that before. I've never found anything written like that. Uh, and Grantland Rice saying that we, we learn more about Babe Ruth in the last years of his life that we would never have known otherwise because of his sickness and suffering and his working with kids. And these are the last two photos I've got here. I love that one on the left. This was in St. Louis one of the last photos that was taken. And the picture on the right is reportedly the last interview that Babe Ruth gave. It was in Minnesota, and it was with an 11-year-old boy named Johnny Ross. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's quite a moving interview of, of the kid coming up with questions for Babe Ruth. And, but Johnny Ross went on to become quite an athlete despite his disability. It was a wrestling, uh, he was a wrestler at the state level and decided that he wanted to help create uh, baseball for the blind. And so he took over beep baseball that was kind of a fledgling game at the time and he improved it. And today he is called the father of beep baseball. I know we have a team here in Boston, 
I don't know about Baltimore and all that, where all the teams are, but it's, it's a nationwide thing. And so the, the person who was significant for that was right there sitting on Babe Ruth's lap at the last months of his life. And so I found that very, very fascinating. And so these are kind of the things that are in this uh, book that I put together. Uh, just some unique things that um, you just haven't found anywhere else. Um, and uh, so, so anyway, that's it. Um, I, open for any questions or comments or anything you wish to add. Bob, uh, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, sure. I'm, I might say, uh, preface it by saying I'm glad to be associated with other people on this call, but I'm in North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, one thing, uh, I was taking a couple of notes as you spoke and as the slides occurred in a very interesting presentation. Uh, the uh, well, you mentioned right at the outset that the cover photo you did you mm -hmm. apparently select that is that correct yeah uh, I, yeah I, I just wondered whether the publisher had to do that or or approved it or something well um, I got permission to use the photo and I suggested it as a cover and um, they pretty much agreed that it, it fit pretty well so but that was from the Chicago Historical Society so. You you have a hard time finding that photo anywhere. Um, yes. Yeah. So it's not a, it's not a normal one. So I thought that fits exactly what was going on here. Uh huh. Okay. And secondly, I had a question about the. I'm sure they're accurate, you know. But well, how did you obtain the financial uh, amounts that were shown on that uh, financial pitfalls? Because they were very specific. That was very impressive. I got some of those from the the minutes of the National League owner meetings, um, and there were some things that were um, posted in newspapers, and then um, Congress in nineteen in the nineteen fifties they opened up the books of for baseball and they published different financial records um, of of teams going back 20 years. And so I found those in a few different places. Uh -huh. Okay. And if you bear with me, a couple more questions. Oh, sure, sure. I hope nobody else minds. Uh, did, did Babe Ruth have anyone who might have advised him to be cautious about that possibility of becoming the manager um, when Judge Fuchs offered that? or it seemed to offer it, not maybe offers the wrong word. Right. Um, anyone, you mean anyone that advised him not to do it? Yeah, someone say, well, take that word if out, you know, yeah. if someone would have said that. It doesn't seem like there was. Now, Claire Ruth, of course, after everything blew up, she said, I knew this wasn't going to work. This was, this smelled rotten from the beginning, you know, but he wanted to do it. Um, so maybe she did. Maybe she did caution him about it, um, mm -hmm. and but he just he he was so um, so convinced he what else was he going to do but be in baseball and so he was just going to jump at anything that was offered to him and um, yeah, I love the quote where um, he's talking about yeah I'm going to become manager in 1936 and we're going to honor Bill McKechnie and move him up to the front office. And this is all news to McKechnie. He'd never heard anything like this. And he's mm -hmm. down in spring training and McKechnie says, what would I do in an office? <laughs> and, and from Judge Fuchs' point of view, do you believe he really had an intention of bringing Ruth up as a manager? Yeah, that I've, I've talked about that before. Um, I, I think if this had gone successfully, I think the judge probably would have found a way to make him a manager. Now, it all depends on McKechnie. Um, I don't think they wanted to get rid of him at all. But if crowds were coming in and the Braves were successful and, you know, Ruth really, you know, did well, um, I I don't think, I don't look at it from the perspective of Ruth double-crossed Fuchs, Fuchs double-crossed Ruth. I just see two desperate people who would do anything to stay in the game. And I think if it would have worked, he certainly would have turned the team over to, to Ruth. Maybe that's not accurate at all. I don't know. That's what I'm thinking. 
Okay. I have my doubts that they would have made Babe Ruth a manager. Okay. I don't think anyone had it. Ruth just didn't have a reputation of being in a baseball mind. I mean, I, I yeah, I, I, I think Ruth was very smart, actually, but I don't think anyone believed it. I, I think it was Ruth, Ruth was putting people in the seats. Right. And right. that's why they had him. That could very well be. And and there were uh, numerous sports reporters who said that about no one goes to the game to see the manager. And Ruth would very much get tired of making pitching changes and doing, you know, tedious things that aren't glamorous. Um, and um, so I, I think it would have, it probably wouldn't have worked anyway. But um, there are some that say he should have at least gotten a chance we know a lot of people walter johnson and and others great players that just were never good managers um and so hey, some would, you know, yeah and some would say at least they could have given him a chance you know and i think the braves would have if if everything had gone well you know if they had finished fourth or something like that um uh, but i don't know yeah but babe ruth i mean look look at this last game where he got a home run or last three home yeah. runs yeah they still lost the game. Oh, yeah. 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 My father went to the game. That's why I've been told Is this. Right? Yeah, he was. My family's from originally from Pittsburgh. You know, I grew up in Baltimore. Uh, but I didn't believe my father until his brother showed me the ticket stubs. But they, you know, Babe Ruth got three home runs in that game. Uh, and the Braves still lost. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So. Yeah, I think yeah, I think you'll like the uh, section in the book about that game in Pittsburgh because there are so many stories coming out of that and so many different tales of where that ball went and oh uh, yeah, quite fascinating. A lot of longtime Pittsburgh people uh, that told those stories for decades. Uh, very very fascinating. Thing. Yeah, my father himself told those stories for decades. But yeah, but as someone who went to St. Mary's Industrial School part two which it turned into cardinal gibbons high school yeah that mural behind in my background is from the high school oh wow so and when i go to gym that's the mural i'd see but uh the thing was babe Ruth was actually a very fascinating person he's mm -hmm. a very good bowler uh although baltimore they have duck pins not 10 pins i don't mm -hmm. think anyone any of you guys ever heard of duck pins yes Okay. I've heard of it. I don't know much about it. Uh, the pins are about half the size of 10 pins. And the ball is about a third of the size of a bowling ball for 10 pins. So, yeah. But uh, but he was a very good duck pin bowler, which in Baltimore means something. Yep. Uh, but I think the most fascinating story was at St. Mary's Industrial School, you had to learn a trade to graduate. Right. Yep. And does anyone have any idea what Babe Ruth's trade was? Shirts. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I kind of laugh because the trade he really learned that he lived off of, of course, he learned baseball. Right. That's the trade he really lived off of. But Babe Ruth made most of his own clothes. Yes. Because he couldn't find his size anywhere. Yeah. The yeah. Most of the clothes he wore, he actually made himself. Yeah. So he, well, said, he, he said if he had uh, never gotten into baseball, he would have been the greatest shirt maker of all time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but so I think Babe Ruth is actually, he's quite intelligent. Yes. But he never had the reputation, so I don't think anyone's going to make him a manager. And it just, you yeah, know. could very well be. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's interesting to think about it. Well, didn't the Dodgers play with him for a while as a coach? Yeah, in 38, he was, yeah, I was gonna say. base coach for a little bit. And very similar to 35, he assumed that he was going to take over um, for, I think, Burley Grimes was the manager. Yeah. And he was on his way out, and he Ruth thought, that's definite. I'm going to get that position. And Leo DeRocher said, you, you son of a bitch, you're not doing that. <laughs> and there was some type of conflict between the two. Um, Leo DeRocher with conflict? I don't believe it. Yeah, imagine <laughs> that. Yeah. And uh, so that didn't happen. And that was another big disappointment for Ruth. Um, yeah. 
but but Ruth actually put a lot of money into St. Mary's, hmm. which the Catholic Church wasn't in orphanages anymore. Hmm. But what he did is he sent a lot of money into Baltimore to fire up the orphanage. And what Baltimore actually did is they bought land, which and then they put it into that building, which became a normal high school. Well, I don't know if it's normal. They graduated me. <laughs> but also they bought land to build a girls' high school next to it. Ah. Which are both now closed, unfortunately. Yeah. But but Roof actually did a lot for youth because a lot of us were able to graduate from Catholic high school in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And most of it was money that Babe Roof poured into the place wow. that allowed that to build for the you know the baby boomers who were able yeah. to graduate. So we actually did a lot of work for Catholic youth. Wow. Long after his death. Wow. So that's another great story that is is not known well enough that's a great story yeah, yeah. when you go there you kind of have to learn that story yeah when you're great so but roof actually did a lot of a lot of work for that mm -hmm. he also spoke at the um they have a catholic uh luncheon where they get guest speakers to come in and he actually spoke at that mm -hmm. at the cleveland club so he's actually quite a kind of character he's a, but i'm convinced he's a lot smarter than most people give him credit for so kind of like the guy never got to know. yeah uh during this time period where ruth was uh towards the end of his career uh radio was uh, uh moving in games were be uh, becoming uh you know over the air broadcast yeah uh was ruth ever approached to be a you know a baseball announcer i've never run across anything like that but it would make perfect sense the way we understand media now. Um, back then, I I never found any references to that. Um, mm. I don't know. Maybe someone else knows stories about that. I don't know. How about any uh, any commercial endorsements or oh anything like that? He he peddled. Oh yeah. Oh both. <laughs> How many? What what yeah, did lots. Yeah. the underwear <laughs> yeah yeah shaving cream uh yeah yeah were those Hair lucrative product. for him uh yes christy walsh made sure they were lucrative yeah. he was really the first agent um sports agent who used ruth as really the probably the first brand of an athlete um and uh so yeah they were very lucrative and walsh taught him to save your money and because ruth was you know in the 20s spending it like it was going out of style and and uh he taught him to hold on to money and so ruth would make comments about you know well i'm not going to be in the soup line anytime soon you know even if i don't get a job managing you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna be bad off um, and uh so yeah christy walsh had a lot to do with that in the business sense well ruth grew up very poor i mean he was in an yeah. orphanage yeah so he was always fearful of going bankrupt. Yeah. And Max didn't taught him to save his money. So he, I mean, he had very little when he was growing up. So he was yeah. very cautious about, he spent a lot of money, but he made a lot of money. He made right. more money than the president. Oh, yeah. 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 Plus, there was no income tax back then. <laughs> one, one point I have, just based on Thomas's uh, comment, and I've never had this before, so I hope I state it in a way that makes a little sense. And that is, if he had not been uh, as admirable as he was in many ways, if he had physically not been portly, uh, look, did not look like another ball player that I know of at that time, do you think his chances of being a manager would have been better, even though he might have had the same personality? When I'm thinking of guys like Ted Williams, who became a manager, mm -hmm. or others, uh, Ruth just looked different from other ball players. And off the field, we know some of them had many of the same faults he had, yeah. except they didn't have as much money. Yeah. I, I think. Well, there's been there's been a, numerous different theories about 
that uh, about why he wasn't given a, a managerial job. I, I think it boils down to there wasn't any owner that wanted to deal with his personality. How do you get rid of him? How do you tame him? Uh, because we know he was he was uh, you know holding out for more money back in the early you know before the nineteen before nineteen twenty he was doing that. Um, there's there's uh, his daughter Julia thought that he would have tried to integrate the game long before Jackie Robinson, um, and some people think think that um, it is a possibility. I mean, we know he was very popular among the African American community and and things like that. Would he have tried to do that? Um, I don't know, um, but I, I think I think it uh, the the institution re was really worried about what would happen if he was in charge of a team. You know, he might turn the Braves into a winner. That might have scared a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have one question that's not really related to Ruth himself, but I, I found it interesting in your talk. Uh, the Request for proposed nicknames to replace the name. <laughs> yes. They came up with bees. Yeah. Do you know any other names that were seriously under consideration? Yeah. <laughs> Let me, uh, it was quite interesting. Um, let's see if I can pull that out. Uh, there, there was quite a few interesting ones. Uh, let's see, where are we here? Wasn't Bean Eaters one of them? Yeah, there was a number of number of things here. Oh, here we go. Fans submitted their entries. Sports writers also suggested nicknames. The Bean, the Beans, the Terriers, the Bags, the Pilgrims, Puritans, Professors, Blues, or Nationals. On January 30, Quinn met with the sports writers to choose the new nickname out of uh, 1,327 uh, entries, which included Bluebirds, Beacons, Colonials, Bulldogs, Bulls, Braddocks, Cotters, uh, Garters, G-Men, Hubs, Lions, Tanks, <laughs> Teddy Bears, Mark Twains, Rosemary's, and Finest, which was uh, Charles Adams' grocery store called Finest. Uh, all that, so... But the, uh, the winning entry was selected from a sheet metal worker of nine children in East Weymouth, Massachusetts. Um, because his, on his entry, he wrote, if your club develops the B characteristics, he wrote in his entry, you should have honey this fall. And so they just love that. <laughs> so it lasts about five years. And then, yeah. then uh, Quinn says, oh, Dave, let's bring back yeah. Ray, you know and, and all yeah. that. But, yeah. i'm just curious about that <laughs> yeah well you mentioned the guy that also was what if he was going but stay in brooklyn he would change the dodgers yes when you think about it dodgers is a pretty dumb name trolley dodgers <laughs> why would they name a team that <laughs> yeah but i have the worst one of all the utah jazz yeah <laughs> yeah you've been to utah yeah well, I had never found any other reference to changing the name of the Dodgers. I never heard of that before. Um, and well, there used to be the bridegrooms. The well, right, there yeah. were other nicknames. Yeah, they they right. changed the name a number of times. Right. right. Well, here's a scary thought for you: hmm. if uh, the football Boston team yeah. owner had bought the Braves, yeah, when he moved to Washington, he might have moved um, the Boston team to Baltimore. Could have, he, yeah. He could have. He couldn't have moved them to Washington because they actually allegedly had a team. Yeah, but he might have moved Boston's National League team to Baltimore. Well, as a matter of fact, Adams was entertaining offers from anywhere, and there was an actual offer from Baltimore. There was a local group that put together enough resources to try to move the Braves to Baltimore. Uh, and the yeah. National League, the National League didn't want to do it. They, they didn't want to break that up and move a team. Um, but there were resources there to do it. Montreal was also rumored. 
Um, so either of those would have changed a lot of baseball oh, history for sure. Yeah, but in the fifties when they were moving everyone everywhere. Yeah. Because that's that's when they right. wanted to have sixteen teams, sixteen cities. Right. That could have been. Yeah, you know, it could have very easily happened. Yeah. That would have been interesting. interesting history. Yeah. They could have moved the St. Louis Browns to Boston. Right. Right. Well, that 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 had to do with Perini moving them to Milwaukee because he was worried that Vec was going to move the Browns to Milwaukee instead of Baltimore, where they came from originally. Yeah. Yeah. If the Braves had gone to Baltimore and the Browns had gone to Boston, Boston would have had another loser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It could have been the Boston Browns. <laughs> BBs. Right. Or just bees, huh? Yeah, it seems yeah. like Baltimore collects brown named teams. All we got to do is an NBA team and be named the Browns and we can move them to Baltimore. <laughs> Guys, I one, one other thing I want to mention. Hank Aaron did something very similar, didn't he? He started in National League. He was in the Braves farm system mm -hmm. before they moved to Milwaukee. So some say if the Braves had hung on a couple more years, would because of because of him coming up, would that have changed a lot of things and kept the franchise in Boston? You know, it's but, uh, interesting thought. But he went back to Milwaukee in a different league. He started playing in the National League in Milwaukee. Yeah. yeah. And came back to finish career in Milwaukee in a different team in a different league, but still yeah. Milwaukee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same thing Babe did. Mm -hmm. Although Barry Bonds broke the cycle. <laughs> of course, I don't think anyone wanted Barry Bonds at that point. <laughs> Bob, I found your uh, your slide presentation very informative. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, I want to congratulate you on your excellent uh, presentation. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, was. I agree with that. That's very good. Yeah. Bob, are you going to the convention in Chicago? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Did you make, uh, Bob, uh, about that presentation, did you make that PowerPoint yourself? Yes. Ooh. More impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Your grandson didn't help you with the PowerPoint? No. No, no children, no grandchildren. So I'm on my own, but I'm a librarian, so I'm used to tinkering oh, around with things. Like that, so. <laughs> All right, guys, we got uh, about eight o'clock, um, and even though there's a lot of rainouts and cancellations for tomorrow, I know there are probably some games. Um, so um, hopefully, I'll see some of you in person in um, in Chicago. Um, also want to mention we were going to do as our summer saber game we were going to go um, I think it was going to be against Texas in May got a lot of feedback that because it was Memorial Day weekend people weren't interested so more than likely we're going to do um, a later summer game probably uh, mid to late August oh, yeah. this will be in uh, you know in the, in the playoff hunt so it'll be a little bit more meaningful perhaps I understand the Oriole home opener tomorrow has been rained out to Friday. Yeah, Friday at three o'clock. So, um, well, you guys, uh, whoever celebrates, have a, a great weekend, a great Easter. And uh, you guys know how to reach me if you need anything. And um, much appreciated, Bob. I'm going to pick that up somewhere down the line. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Sir. Thank you. Right, good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.